Welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, this week we're going to continue our series on eating with Jesus, particularly from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Alan is going to be uh, unpacking the passage a bit later. Uh, I hope you're well. As always, we're going to start off with a confession. We're going to come towards God and confess the, our brokenness, uh, both the things that we've done to break the world and ourselves and also the way that we are, have been broken. Let's pray together. Remember, Lord, your compassion and love, for they are everlasting. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, but think on me in your goodness, O Lord, according to your steadfast love. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. O keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I have put my trust in you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in Lord Jesus Christ and keep you in life eternal. Amen. We can be bold and confident in hearing the absolution because God is faithful. His faithfulness is underpin all that we do he is faithful even through death by raising his son to glory so let's sin about that faithfulness our reading before Alan comes and brings us the sermon. The reading is from the Gospel according to Luke, beginning at chapter 14, verse 15. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, 
Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town, and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you have ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes, and compel people to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Do you enjoy invitations to big occasions with sumptuous food and drink? Uh, sorry, that's not an offer. I guess most of us like to be invited out. But not so many of those occasions have been available recently, have they? But there is something special, isn't there, about having a big celebration with others, especially if it involves lots of good food and liquid refreshment. Perhaps that's why life after death is sometimes pictured as a banquet, even though we may not necessarily understand it literally as a never-ending round of overeating. We see over and over again in the Gospels the religious leaders increasingly criticising Jesus for not conforming to their ideas of a godly life. He was condemned for going to social gatherings and eating and drinking with all the wrong sorts of people, the ones the respectable people considered the dregs of society and labelled as sinners. Eventually, the leaders feel so threatened by what Jesus says and does that they start plotting to get rid of him. Nevertheless, there are two occasions in the Gospels, in Luke's Gospel, where Jesus is actually invited to eat at the home of one of the Pharisees. This second meal invitation is reported in Luke chapter 14, coming just before this morning's reading. After breaking their additional restrictive Sabbath day rules to heal a very sick man, Jesus goes on to tell the people present at the meal that when they host a big meal, like a banquet, they shouldn't just invite wealthy people, people like themselves, who can invite them back, but invite the poor and disabled, of which there were many in first century Palestine, where there was no social security of any kind or of any benefit system. Jesus says if they do that, God will reward their generosity to the poor in the next life, after the resurrection of the dead, which Jewish people believed would come at the end of this life. Jesus says at that time, those generous and merciful people will be especially blessed. And then the subject of banquets and blessings is a cue for one of the guests at the meal to say, how blessed are those who will eat at the feast in the future kingdom of heaven? At that time, the image of a feast was often used to describe life in God's kingdom after life on earth. And Jesus uses this guest's comment to tell them all a parable. Another story of his from everyday life, but one which has a spiritual meaning. It's ostensibly a story about the responses to an invitation to a rich man's banquet. But actually, it's about how people in every day and age respond, or not, to God's love. And Jesus' invitation to enter the kingdom of God now and in the next life. I'm sure most of us are familiar with the parable of the Great Feast. Or perhaps we could call it the Beggar's Banquet. If not, here's a recap. There was once a rich and powerful man who planned a feast. He invited hundreds of people. In fact, he invited them twice. First, an early warning to tell them the dinner was planned. And then a message on the day to say that the food was ready and time to come. And guess what? Nobody came. Nobody. One after another they sent their excuses. Sorry, I've just bought a field. I must go and inspect it. Sorry, I've just bought some oxen. I must go and try them out. Sorry, I've just got married. I must stay with my wife. That probably wouldn't have stopped them going down the pub if there was one. The host was furious. Their excuses were utterly flimsy. The truth was that they just didn't want to come. They thought they had better things to do. 
Nobody buys a field without seeing it first. Nobody buys ten oxen without trying them first. And as for being married, that doesn't stop you eating. He could have even brought his wife with him. But then the master had an idea. He sent his servant to search the back streets, to bring in the poor, to lead in the blind and the cripples, and still there was room. So the master sent his servant out of town to the country roads and lanes, the hedges and ditches where tramps doss down, where lepers hide. Force them to come in, shouted the master. I won't take no for an answer. I want my house to be full. If my friends won't come, I'll invite strangers. What a scene! Hundreds of down and outs having the feast of a lifetime, a real beggar's banquet. And the happiest man there was the master. The meaning of the parable was hard to miss. The guests at the Pharisee's house, like the invited guests in the parable, were religious Jews, seeing themselves as God's own people already. But, surprise, Jesus says many of them won't enter the kingdom of heaven on God's terms. And many of the people they look down on as foreigners and sinners will accept God's invitation and discover a totally different quality of life, beginning now and stretching beyond death into eternity. So how do we fit into that story? Because it is still relevant to us today. Even though we're not first century Jews, or I hope today's equivalent of the Pharisees. Jesus is saying God loves everyone and he wants us all to be able to share life with him now and forever. We were created for a relationship with our creator, which is better than any banquet but we can only come on his terms and in his time. The invitation card is Jesus hanging on the cross. The servants are those who have responded to Jesus' invitation. Come to me, he says, and I will give you rest and refreshment. Today's excuses are not fields to inspect or oxen to try out but any aspect of life that we put as a priority before finding peace and new life with God. It may be a demanding job. It may be the need to make ends meet financially. Or it may be that we just don't feel ready to respond to Jesus' challenge. Follow me. We may be willing to respond to Jesus' call at some point, but we can put it off for all kinds of reasons. Or perhaps simply, just don't get round to it. For some people, life at present may seem just too full of things which need to be done, and not enough time to do them in. Maybe later, we can think about yet another commitment, but not now. Well, as someone rather pithily put it, those who plan to turn to God at the eleventh hour often die at 10.30. We can miss out on God's best for us by prioritising things which are not bad in themselves, but they just get in the way of responding to his invitation. Besides, what will people think of us if they believe that we've gone all religious? In today's world, identifying ourselves openly with Jesus may come at a cost. Others may have the wrong impression that Jesus was a miserable killjoy who wants to stop us enjoying life when in fact the opposite is true. He offers real joy and a life lived to the full. Perhaps some people think they can keep in with God just by trying to be good. The truth is we can never be good enough without his help. And first of all we need to be forgiven for all the ways we fall short of God's perfect plans for our lives. For the selfish choices and actions which would cut us off from a loving but holy God. And that's why Jesus died for us. When we make our personal response to Jesus, he offers to blot out our failures and help us to get the best out of life, now, in real terms, 
and the best is yet to come, when we reach the end of this life, whenever that might be, and we go on to be with Jesus in the next. There are a lot of uncertainties around us, especially just now, with the threat of catching the virus ourselves, or losing someone we love to it. So much of normal life has been suspended for the past five months, and there's no clear end in sight. The resulting economic uncertainty may have a serious effect on our future livelihood. Our God wants us to get the best out of life, but it's good to know that whatever happens now, he has planned a glorious future when time as we know it is wrapped up and he sets up his perfect kingdom on earth forever. Jesus invites us to be part of that kingdom, but we need to accept his invitation and join him in building his kingdom in the here and now. When our current social restrictions come to an end, I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunities to go to celebration meals. Some may be low-key occasions, some may be more like a great feast. Let's enjoy them when they come. But more importantly, in the light of today's Bible reading, don't miss the best party of all time when time as we know it is over. Jesus offers us life to the full in the here and now, as well as that life continuing into eternity. In the terms of Jesus' parable, the two invitations, the first and the second, have already gone out. They were sent out 2,000 years ago by Jesus as he died on the cross for us. But they are still valid today. They're offered to everyone, no matter how good or bad they may have been. But like many invitations, there are four very important letters at the end. R. S. V. P. Répondez, s'il vous plaît. When we receive an invitation, it's important to check whether or not we've replied. So whatever you do, don't miss the party. I hope to see you all there. Let's respond to the word by praying together. Father God, thank you for all that you've given us. Lord, thank you for the blessings in our life. Grow in us a thankful heart that we may look to you, acknowledging your love and your presence. And Lord, we pray for all those who are sick, who are grieving, who are troubled. Lord, bring healing to the sick by the power of your Holy Spirit. Bring comfort to those who are grieving by the acknowledgement of the hope they have in the resurrection. And bring comfort to those who are troubled. Bring peace that they may know the love of God. And Lord, we pray for all those in power, powers of authority, positions of authority, Lord, we pray for the government that they may diligent, govern diligently and wisely towards the common good. Lord, we pray for our bishops, Graham, Sarah and Justin, that they may draw their knowledge from on high. And Lord, finally, we pray for our local church, Mary's Hampton, that we may reach every corner of Hampton with the love of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing our final song the band lead us.
come to the end of our service. The um, well, things will continue like usual. Hopefully, the the after coffee coffee. After coffee, after service coffee will happen in a moment. Uh, Nick will be hosting, so Nick, go and press that button that, that makes it happen. The details will appear as if by magic on the screen. Um, really, it's planning rather than magic. Um, I hope you're all looking after yourself. Um, do keep in touch and uh, touch base with everyone. Let me pray for God's blessing to be upon you. The peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And be Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>